worshipping God in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verse 19 to 42. My beloved brethren and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, during the course of our last class, brethren and sisters, together, we endeavoured to lay the background for this discussion between the Lord Jesus Christ and that woman of Samaria. We saw together the terrible hatred that existed between those two races of people, and for good reason. And we saw also that that hatred was mutual, that one hated the other just as much. And of course, this great animosity, brothers and sisters, was a dreadful thing as these people dwelt in the midst of Judea and Galilee, so that travellers up and down that country would have to avoid that area, otherwise be embroiled in terrible controversies. It was scarcely imaginable that our Lord Jesus Christ would ever convert a Samaritan, even talk to them. And yet we have in this chapter a remarkable conversion of that woman. And we saw also in our last class together how that that is set against the, uh, the discussion which he had with Nicodemus, the rule of the Jews who came to him by night, and this immoral woman of Samaria who came to him in the blaze of noon. And their all flesh would see the glory of Yahweh and they would be united, as Isaiah said. And here, of course, we have the two extremes of all flesh. We made some comments, brethren and sisters, about the fact that it was near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph that all this took place. There were many of you who didn't quite follow us on that occasion, but rather than go back into that now, suffice it to say this, that Joseph, whose name means the increaser, stood for the principle, brethren and sisters, of the adoption of Gentiles into the family of God that he might increase the family of God. Now we learn that, of course, in Genesis chapter 48 when Jacob had those two sons of Joseph brought before him and the principle of adoption was here set before us in what Jacob said on that occasion. And we read in the 48th chapter of Genesis and in verse 5 that Jacob said this, and here on this particular occasion he adopted the two sons of Joseph into his own family, the family of Israel. And in Genesis 48 and verse 5, And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born under thee in the land of Egypt before I came under thee in the, into Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. You will note, brethren and sisters, that Jacob makes the point here that not only were these two boys born in Egypt, but they were born in Egypt before he came there. Of course, you might say we didn't need to know that. It was obvious that happened. But Jacob nonetheless makes that point. In other words, he had nothing to do with those two boys until that point of history. They were unknown to him. And then he took them into his family and gave them equal status with his two firstborn, Reuben and Simeon. And hence, Jacob's two sons increased the family of Israel by adoption. That's what Jacob stood for. That's the principle of his name. And we illustrated that, brethren and sisters, when we pointed out that Barnabas, of course, who was so named by the apostles, his real name was Joseph. And when he was sent to Antioch by the Jerusalem Ecclesia to see what all these Gentiles were doing, he came there and we read that much people were added to the Lord. And Barnabas, whose name, of course, was Joseph, he also increased the family of God by the principle of adoption. Now that's why Jesus sat thus at that well. And that's why John made the point near to that little spot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph and up come a woman of Samaria. Now in the blessing of Joseph, brethren and sisters, which is the next chapter of Genesis, have a look at verse 5. Before you read it, let me tell you this about Jacob's well. It's a remarkable spot where Jacob's well is. And tradition has it that in the, in the days when the Lord came there, and for many years afterwards, they say, there was a parapet around the hole of that well. They built a little wall around that well. And you can picture our Lord coming there and sitting upon that parapet. And we read in verse 22 of, of Genesis 49 of the blessings of Joseph, the increaser. And here we read this. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well. By a well whose branches run over the wall. Have a look at the margin. Whose daughters run over the wall. And there he was sitting thus at Jacob's well, brethren and sisters, and here comes a future daughter of God. 
And she was running over that wall because she was outside the confines of Israel. There is a remarkable prophecy. And if we were in any doubt as to whether that means that, if you were listening carefully last time, you would have heard those verses quoted in Psalm 80 when it dealt with a little flock of Joseph that as the shepherd of Israel shone between the cherubim and went east, that Ephraim, Benjamin and Manasseh, who formed the western side of the camp, followed him. And that's the flock of Joseph, his two sons and his only full-blooded brother. And that psalm, that, rather, that chapter of Genesis 49, is actually quoted in that psalm. She sent out her vows under the river and her branches under the sea. And the feminine pronoun is again used, indicating the call of the Gentile ecclesia who would run over that wall and the fruitful vine of God's purpose, having its stock in our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the vine, and the disciples are the branches, and the branches, brothers and sisters, were not hemmed in by that parapet, but they ran over that wall and included that woman of Samaria, as along with a lot of other Gentiles with her. Now we learn that she was, she came to him at the sixth hour, that is at noon. And when we come back to the fourth chapter of John, we pick up our story now, as she, she comes to our Lord Jesus Christ and that conversation commences. In verse 7 we read that Then cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. You know, brethren and sisters, our Lord Jesus Christ set many very fine examples. And he didn't ask that drink there because he was thirsty only. But you know, one of the mo most wonderful ways we can help anybody is to grant them a privilege of doing us a favour. Now, I don't mean by that that we should go around asking people to do us favours. But sometimes, you know, brethren and sisters, great friendships are built up if you allow someone to help you rather than patronise them. And our Lord Jesus Christ granted that woman the privilege of doing him a favour. And she would have been quite surprised. Not only that he spoke to her, that would have been one surprise, of course, because she wasn't surprised at that. But that he would allow her to do him a favour, I believe, would have been immediately appreciated by her. But of course she had a problem. She said, look, how is it that you're a Jew and you ask a drink of me, which I'm a woman of Samaria? For, she said at the end of verse 9, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You can leave out the definite article because it's not there in the Greek. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. It's even more emphatic if you leave the article out. Generally it's the other way around. But this time it comes out more emphatically. Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. You know, brethren and sisters, another tremendous example is set by our Lord Jesus Christ. He never entered into the politics of that. He left that question begging. He didn't enter into the politics about Jewish and Samaritan controversy. He went right above it. Because, you see, he knew what was in that woman's mind. And in that woman's mind, as came out later on, that as she came near that well, she thought to herself, that that well was a wonderful gift that Jacob had given to all those Gentile people to whom he had left it at that place at Shechem. All his family had, had drunk water there. All his cattle had been given water there, as the woman pointed out. And when he left the place at Shechem, he left that to the Gentiles. And as she approached that well, her heart was full of appreciation for that well. And she was going to make that point to the Lord. And before she could make that point, he said, if only you, who, you knew who it was that said to you, give me water to drink, he said, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him and he would have given thee living water. Look at the emphasis on the pronouns. So the woman's coming up and she's very much appreciative of that well. She's quite surprised that this Jewish stranger should talk to her. Even more surprised that he would grant her the privilege of doing him a favour. And then before anything can be done, he's got it all reversed back the other way. He got it all reversed back the other way because she is going to be the receiver and he's going to be the giver. And straight away, brethren and sisters, her mind would be wide open as to what was going to go on here. But no sooner she, she, would she feel in position to help him that suddenly she's put on the spot that he can do something for her that nobody else can. And as for gifts, which was in her mind about that, well, if only she knew who the gift of God was. God gave his only begotten son. We read in the previous chapter, brethren and sisters. And all over the scriptures, the Lord Jesus Christ is depicted as the gift of God. Shall he not with him, says the apostle, freely give us all things in Romans 8 and in many other passages of the scripture, unto us a son is 
given. The word Nathan, which means a gift, is used in that passage in Isaiah. And here is the gift of God. Never mind about what Jacob might have done. Look at this gift. And Jesus pointed out to her, if she would ask him, he would have given her living water. Living water. That was an expression, brethren and sisters, used under the law of Moses to describe running water. Water that had run for a distance and by thus the movement in the water having cleansed it, all the, imped all, all the impediments had fallen through it and the water was clean as it gurgled over the rocks. They would gather that water and they would call it living water. One of the most wonderful expressions which we won't turn to now is found in the 26th chapter of Genesis where we read about living water, brethren and sisters. Where Isaac, the seed of promise in, down in Beersheba, where he went down to a place called Gerah and wrecked a hundredfold. The only man of the scriptures ever said that on. A man who typified our Lord Jesus Christ, who, who sowed his seed and reaped a hundredfold. And there he had a well of which it says is living water. The only difference was this. That whereas he was there typifying the seed of promise with a well of living water, and he was the real seed of promise, the difference, brothers and sisters, was that Isaac fought with the Philistines over those well, and one was called contention, and the other one was called hatred. There were no such things here. All the contention and hatred Jesus left between Jews and Samaritans. He never entered into the politics of that. He came there to talk about love and goodwill, and about the gift of God. And unlike Isaac, who had to leave that place with contention and hatred behind him over living water, there was no such thing here, brethren and sisters. And as I say, our Lord, our Lord avoided that controversy. Might be as well now, just have a look at the 17th chapter of Jeremiah and see what he says about living water. We don't turn back out of the record, brothers and sisters, too many times. And when we do, of course, it's because that there are some interesting things in the context to be seen. Look what it says about living water in Jeremiah 17. Think about this woman, brethren and sisters. In the 17th chapter of Jeremiah, in verses 13 and 14, we read, O Yahweh, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken Yahweh, the fountain of living waters. Heal me, O Yahweh, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. And that woman, brethren and sisters, was coming to Yahweh, and she was going to have to learn that he was the hope of Israel, and that that was what was symbolized in that living water of which our Lord was referring to, even himself, as the living fountain of water, of his great and wonderful heavenly father. And she was going to be healed and saved in that place. Rather beautiful, you know, that our Lord Jesus Christ himself would have appreciated that. You know, it says back in the, we won't turn this up either, but it says back in the 33rd chapter of Genesis, brethren and sisters, that when that well was first dug and Jacob came there, it says, and Jacob came to Salem, which is Shechem. Actually, the words, the, the, the name Salem there is not a proper name at all and shouldn't be so rendered. It's the word Shalom. So many uh, translators of the scripture render that. And so Jacob came in peace to Shechem. But the word also means, brethren and sisters, to be made whole. And when you realize that that was said of Jacob in chapter 33, that in chapter 32 he has just been crippled by the angel in a most terrible way, so that he would have had a shocking strain sinew right down his spine, his hip right out of joint, he would have been in agony when he came to that place. And we read that Jacob was made whole right there. And the Lord Jesus Christ, being wearied with his journey, sat thus in Jacob's well. Heal me, O Yahweh, and save me. What a wonderful thing that was, brothers and sisters, as he would have meditated upon that incident in Jacob's life and realized the goodness of God in, in taking away the searing pain from Jacob's body at that occasion and making him whole as he sat thus at that well. And with all those thoughts in his mind, this conversation is, is now struck up between him and this woman. Verse 11, she said to him, 
Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, and whence then hast thou this living water? You know, the woman's quite talkative. You know, if you look at this record that John presents us to us, brethren and sisters, it's quite obvious that she was a fairly loose woman. We make no excuses for her. Wonderful person though she was to become. Nonetheless, the record presents her as very loose and very talkative. She had a lot to say. Started off being a little pert, really. The Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. What are you doing talking to me? But she's not long before she's calling him Sir. That's curious in the Greek. Lord. Not long before she's addressing him in very wonderful and profound respect. You've got nothing to draw with, she said. The disciples had gone away, brethren and sisters, to look for food. And they'd be a long time looking for food in the land of the Samaritans because precious little were they allowed to buy. There were great restrictions on what could be bought from Samaritans. Only things that were covered with skin like fruit or things like had the shell of an egg. Things that couldn't be polluted from the outside. That's all they were allowed to buy. They'd be a fair while looking for food. And now here he is left alone and no instruments to draw with. Little did the woman know, brethren and sisters, that he didn't need anything to draw with because he's the source of water. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, said the seventh chapter of John. The well's deep, said the woman. hundred feet, brethren and sisters, it is. They take you to a well there today. Whether it's Jacob's well or not, who knows? But I tell you what, brethren and sisters, it is one of those spots in Israel which I suppose if there's some doubt about it, it would be nearer than most. A remarkable thing it is. Dug so that it goes down and then spreads out. You look straight down there and down below you actually see the water flowing at the bottom of that well like an underground river flowing along. A hundred feet deep was that well. Jacob did it well when he dug that one, brothers and sisters. And he was renowned for it. But if that well was deep, the one sitting on the well was deeper. The words of the wise, said the psalmist, are like, are like deep water. They run very deep. And he was certainly deep. And he was going to get deeper and deeper, brothers and sisters, as he spoke to that woman. Now the woman herself was a bit taken back. And she thought, now he's a bit of an egotist. He's going to give me living water. Are you greater, she says, than our father Jacob, who gave us this well? Of course he was greater. But she's yet to realise that, brothers and sisters. You know, she's a liar in the bargain because they were not descendants of Jacob. Though they said they were, they claimed to be descendants from Ephraim and Manasseh. That is not so. Many historians have gone into the record and see whether or not they were indeed a mongrel race, whether there was any intermingling. But whether they, whatever the commentators say or whatever the historian might say, Jesus called them people of another race. Jacob was not their father. And they chose sometimes to ignore their so-called descent from Ephraim and Manasseh, when it suited them. If things weren't going well with Israel, the Samaritans claimed no relationship. And if they were going well, they made their claim of relationship. And we know how that went on in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah and Joshua and Zerubbabel and all the trouble that they had of the false claims of the Samaritans who said they were Jews and were not. Our father Jacob. And she said, you greater than him, she said, in verse 12, which gave us the well, drank there of himself and his children and his cattle, in other words, she's saying, you, a poor, weary traveller, sitting on that well, waiting to be refreshed by somebody else, who haven't even got means to get the water himself, and you're talking about Jacob, you're greater than him. Look, he drank of that water, and his children, and his cattle, good enough for him, good enough for me. That was the attitude, brethren and sisters. Well, the Lord had an answer for that too. Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. That, was, that couldn't be gainsaid, brethren and sisters, could it? But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. There is an expression, brethren and sisters, in that answer, shall never thirst, that is taken from the 49th chapter of Genesis. We won't have a look at it now. We'll reserve it for when it's actually quoted later on in a larger context. But that 49th chapter of Genesis is full of meaning as far as the calling of the Gentiles is concerned. It's a major chapter in that regard. Suffice it to say that Jesus is alluding to those things that there will be that water which would spring up into everlasting life, springing up into everlasting life. The word means to leap up. 
you have a look at the 44th chapter of Isaiah. Now she claimed Jacob to be their father. Well, little did the woman realise at this stage, brethren and sisters, that Jacob was about to come, become her father in a manner which he never, ever contemplated. And when we read about the seed of Jacob in Isaiah 44, here are people springing up. Look what it says. Isaiah 44, verses 1 to 5. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen, Thus saith Yahweh that made thee and formed thee from the womb and will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshur in whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring and they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. You know, brothers and sisters, willows by the water courses, the wild grass, grows a bit quicker than the grain. The willow tree, once it gets the scent of the water, once the roots get where it want to go, it absolutely goes like fire. And what Isaiah is trying to tell us, brothers and sisters, that whereas the truth of Yahweh never, ever really worked on Israel over the centuries and centuries and centuries of time, that when that water got poured on the dry ground of Gentilism, it absolutely rocketed out of the earth. And they sprang up. 3,000 believed at Pentecost, most of them Jews, of course, and from there it spread through the world like wildfire. There's the seed of Jacob. And here he's telling that woman, you drink this water and you'll go and you'll thirst again. But the water that I got will leap up. And there's the expression of it. And we read in verse 5, and one shall say, I'm Yahweh. Another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. Another shall subscribe with his hand unto Yahweh and surname himself by the name of Israel. In other words, what verse 5 is telling us, brethren and sisters, here are men from, and women from all nations and they're calling themselves by all sorts of names. But they've all got this in common. They have to do with Israel, with Jacob, with, with the God who have, who's called them to that great and glorious hope of Israel, whether it be Yahweh or whether it be Jacob or whether it be Israel or whatever. They're using the language of the truth. And they're springing up everywhere as a result of that living water being poured out upon that dry and parched ground and getting that immediate result that Isaiah 44 is speaking about. But you see, nobody gets that water without price. When we go back to John 4, brothers and sisters, we learn that lesson. Oh yes, Isaiah the prophet said, Come buy, without money and without price. Yes, without money, but still you've got to buy it, brothers and sisters. You don't get it for nothing. Might not be with shekels of gold and silver, but price has got to be paid. And when we come back to this offer of our Lord Jesus Christ, having told the woman about that wellspring of life, in verse 15, she said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Doesn't want to do anything, see? Now, much different than the Jews, you know, in the feeding of the 5,000. God gave us bread from heaven. What are you going to do? Well, if they want something for nothing, I don't want to come hither to draw. She doesn't want to walk over there all the time and get that water. But she's got to come back, brothers and sisters. Go call thy husband. What a marvellous thing that was. Because what the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do with her is to test her sincerity and her truth. That's what that chapter's about. And whether or not she answers correctly, or otherwise, she's got to come back. She's got to draw. With joy, she's got to draw water out of that world of salvation. She's not going to get it for nothing. And the Lord now puts the conversation on another level. He steers it in a different direction. And this woman, who is very, very full of words, very vulnerable, very much so. He's going to silence her, brethren and sisters. You're going to have to think for a while. Go and call your husband. And you can imagine that moment in history. And this woman who saw this Lord, as she called him, who suddenly has a growing respect for him, doesn't really know who he is, but has a growing respect for him. No ordinary man is this. And she would struggle in her mind. My husband? would she tell him? What would you tell him? 
You can imagine her thinking it over. And she decided to tell him the truth. And she was sincere about it. I have no husband. Now we know that that was said in sincerity and in truth. You know why we know that? Because the Lord said it. In verse 17 he said, Thou hast well said. And in verse 18 he said, In that saidest thou truly. Thou hast well said. It was said sincerely. In that thou saidest truly. It was said truthfully. And that coming to the Lord, brethren and sisters and sisters, was not so much putting something upon the woman that really she didn't deserve, because I believe he saw the thoughtfulness in that, and he was no ordinary woman. And despite the fact that she had a very great weakness in her life, was a terrible, immoral woman. There's no question of that. People try to defend her in this record. You, it's, you can't defend people like that. They've got to come out in the open and be seen for what they are. In the blaze of noon, she's got to be seen for what she is. But this wonderful thing about her is that when she was faced with somebody that she perceived was greater than she was, she decided to be sincere and truthful. Thou hast well said, thou hast said truly, you've had five husbands, and the one you've now got is not your husband. You know, brethren and sisters, there was more in that than meets the eye. Do you know the Samaritans had five gods? You want to see them? Second of Kings 17. They're all here. Exactly five of them. Her personal history was like the national history of the people. What a mix up here. Here's the history of the Samaritan in the second of Kings chapter 17. Look at the, look at the mix up. Verse 29. How be it every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. Now you count them with me. And the men of Babylon made Sakoth Benoth, one. And the men of Cuth made Nergal, two. The men of Hamath made Ashamar, three. And the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak, four. And the Sephavites burnt their children in the fire to Adremelech, and, and, and Adremelech, the gods of the Sephavites. Five. You've got five husbands. Not brothers and sisters that she didn't have five husbands, but he was referring to the five gods of the Samaritans. She did have five husbands. And so did the people. And they didn't know where they were. And they didn't know what their relationship was. And they didn't know who they were or where they'd come from or where their gods were. And they had a hodgepodge of a religion. And if you read the second of Kings 17 carefully, you will read that when Sennacherib received from them a deputation that he would send someone back to teach them the manner of the God of the land, he sent one Jewish priest who taught them the manner of the God of the land. And the rest of the people were a mix-up of all the people of the East, the mysticism, the astrologers, all the superstitious. And they'd got five husbands. And the one that they worshipped then was of no consequence any rate, any more than her husband was the one who was really her husband that she lived with now. And apart from all that, brethren and sisters, that's the Lord's commentary on the marriage question. Whatever we might think, whatever people might think that baptism washes away our former life and therefore all our former relationships are gone, not according to that. That woman had no relationship with the truth, did she? She couldn't have come to baptism and said, well, my five husbands are washed away in history because he said you've had five husbands and he who you now have is not your husband. In that you said sincerely and truly. That's his commentary upon what he thinks about the marriage question. One man, one woman for life. The Lord stood for no other principle than that, brethren and sisters. Well, of course, that was the turning point in the woman's life. That absolutely staggered her. Verse 19, she says, you're a prophet. And I suppose when she said that, brethren and sisters, she thought she'd come to the truth. Well, she had a long way to go. Later on, she recognized him, or rather he made the statement that he was the Messiah in verses 25 and 26, and she still hadn't come to the totality of belief. She had to come to the belief, brethren and sisters, that he was the Son of God. But for the moment, she thinks he's a prophet. Then she says, 
I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And you know, people say that. Oh, look, she's dodging the issue. I don't believe she is for one second. I believe we're seeing the real woman. You know, some say she's, she's diverting the conversation away from her marriage situation because it was very embarrassing to her. I don't believe that for a minute. I believe, brethren and sisters, that beneath all that immorality, there was a conscience. The woman did have religious feelings. But how could you expect her to be any different with all the, the mix-up in which she was mixed up? And even though Jesus made reference to the fact that the Jews at least had the oracles of God, how could she ever believe them? Because they wouldn't spit on her. And when she saw them go past, if they ever did go there, in companies of people, with their supercilious looks and their self-righteousness and their feelings and looks of utter contempt, how could she ever come to the truth, that poor wretch of a woman? But this she wanted to know. She wanted an answer to the burning question of the day. Where is true worship? And I believe, brethren and sisters, what the very answers of our Lord show that that woman was deeply genuine when she seized her opportunity. And if I'd be permitted to paraphrase this record that I might demonstrate what I believe she was thinking, that here she is, being sent to get her husband, pauses and considers, what will I tell this man? And looking at him and sizing him up, thinking, well, really, there's not much I can hide from him. I'll be sincere about it and I'll tell the truth. And she did. And the Lord commenting upon that, the woman says, look, you've told me about my, my husband. You've got to be a prophet. And if you're a prophet, you can answer this question. You're the one that can answer it. And you can see the question was uppermost in her mind. I want to know the truth of the matter. Now she says, our fathers. Note that, brethren and sisters. Our fathers, she said, worshipped in this mountain, Mount Gerizim. You know, in the Samaritan Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible, which Pentateuch means, five volumes, in those first five volumes, the Samaritans actually altered the text of Deuteronomy and said that the altar was built upon Mount Gerizim, but it wasn't, it was built upon Mount Ebal. But they blatantly misrepresented the text and put the altar at Mount Gerizim. That's how far they were prepared to go to, to enable their corrupt religion to be recognised as the truth. But that woman saw through that, brethren and sisters. She wasn't duped by that. She was worried about that. She didn't altogether accept that. She knew there was something wrong. And yet she didn't believe the Jews either. She really wanted to know what it was, where it was that true worship was going to be conducted. Well, Jesus said this. Verse 21. Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem, worship the Father. The hour cometh. You know, he was to say later on in verse 23, the hour cometh and now is. But for the moment, brethren and sisters, until people came to recognise him for what he was, local worship would continue. And if local worship continues, then true worship's in Jerusalem. That's the answer of our Lord. But that's only momentarily. But for the moment, true worship is in Jerusalem. And the Lord said, the day is going to come when neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem. And you know, brethren and sisters, as mere places, as mere localities, the Lord equates the two. No different. Well, we know that Jerusalem is the holy city, the city of the great king. We know that. But if you're going to make mere places of matters, there's no difference with that or shed. But the hour is going to come when people are going to worship, now note it, the Father. And so the woman wouldn't forget the point twice in verse 23, the Father. The hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father. In spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. But you see, the woman said, our fathers, plural worshipped in this mountain. And you know, brethren and sisters, there were a plurality of fathers, as there are a plurality of fathers in Christendom, the chief of which will arrive here very shortly in this country. And he's only one father of hundreds of fathers, and they are, they are fathers of all their apostate children, illegitimate, the whole lot of them. But there's only one father, 
And if the Father is going to call upon men and women to worship him, and there's only one Father, then everyone that comes to him, they themselves are related, aren't they? And that'll end the controversy, won't it? And if the Jews and the Samaritans, who have no dealings with each other, were introduced to the same Father, that would be an end to the controversy, if ever there was. And so the Lord, three times, emphasises that. The Father. You know, the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians, he was writing to the strong who despised the weak. And he wrote to the weak who look with contempt upon the strong. And he says that some men with conscience of the idol wouldn't eat the meat offered to the idol. Other men who knew that an idol was nothing in the world had a free conscience and ate all sorts of things. And they despised each other, the one for eating and the other not eating. But he says, but unto us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we by him. But unto us, he says, there is but one God, the Father, weak and strong. And in the first Corinthians 8 and verse 6, Paul brought the two parties together from war, those two warring factions in recognising that they were the children of the same Father. No greater way, brethren and sisters, to end family rows than to direct the children to the parents. Children are thoughtful children as they've grown up old enough to be thoughtful and they're fighting and squabbling over the tea table or in the kitchen or around the sink or wherever or in the bedroom and fighting and squabbling if attention is drawn to that child and to that child and the one standing in between is the father of both of them. If that doesn't end the row, there's something wrong in the spiritual teaching of that house. And not children's eyes were directed to the father. And they'd look at the father or the mother and they'd say, fair enough. And cease arguing. That's the point the Lord is going to make. True worshippers are going to all be made to worship the father. Not fathers. And then the Lord says this in verse 22, ye worship, ye know not what. And that was exactly right. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Wonderful reference, brethren and sisters, for lectures. It is too. I use that of course myself quite a lot and so we ought to. It's a marvellous reference you know to teach that there's no such thing as a trinity. We often teach it to show that the truth of the scriptures is directed to the hope of Israel. But you think about that in relation to the trinity. If salvation is from the Jews never, you show me a Jew who believes in the trinity. Credible. But you see the whole point of it is this. That verse of scripture was never uttered by the Lord to teach that the truth is unique to Israel. He never said that. Matter of fact, it was to teach exactly the opposite. Because he didn't say salvation is of the Jews. But the Greek text really says salvation is from the Jews. In other words, what he's saying, brethren and sisters, yes, you've got to seek for the truth in Israel, but the truth is not unique to them. It is not something that finishes with them. It is a continuous thing. He's going to tell his disciples later on in verse 34, Jesus said to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Didn't finish with the Jews. What were they, brethren and sisters, but the channel of truth? That's what they were. You know what it says in the 8th chapter of Zechariah? That in the age to come, ten men out of all languages of the nations shall take hold of the skirt of him as a Jew and say, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. And the reason they will, brethren and sisters, do that, not because they come to recognise that the truth is unique to Israel, but they come to know that that is God's method and always has been of finishing his work. All the Jew is are standing in the middle. Now I want to show you a marvellous reference. One you know well. Fourth chapter of Deuteronomy. <coughs> Salvation is from the Jews. You listen to this. When you read, read carefully. In the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy, we read this. Here's the purpose of God with Israel. They're going to be the channel of truth. It's not going to stop with them. It's going to move on. So in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6, Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, 
Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as Yahweh our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? You know, brethren and sisters, you read those words and you think, yes, that's right. There's Israel being the channel of truth. But read them again. Look at verse 7. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh to them as Yahweh our God? That's the voice of the Gentiles saying that. And they're saying it because they've been brought nigh to that God through Israel. For them, brethren and sisters, salvation is from the Jews. Yahweh our God is their voice as they lift it up to show their affinity with that people because they've been led to that God by those Jewish people. And there are scores of references in, that re- in this respect that the Israel were the channel of salvation. Therefore, what the Lord is saying to the woman, he's not saying to her, look, you're wrong and the Jews are right. He's saying that she can be right if she goes in through the Jewish channel. He's offering her salvation. It's not a negative statement, brethren and sisters, as far as she's concerned. He's not giving her a negative answer. He's giving her a positive one. And he goes on giving it to her. Inviting her to see it in that way. Look, he said to the woman, in verse 23 of John 4, The hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, of course, brethren and sisters, you may all well know The famous point here, that Joshua, in the 24th chapter of the book of his name, sat in exactly the same locality and said almost exactly the same words. Instead of saying spirit and truth, he said sincerity and truth. As he brought all Israel between Ebal and Gerizim at Shechem, at this locality, Yahoshua said those words in that place. And we're going to come back there in a moment. We're reserving that again too because we want to show you that's not the only place where Joshua 24 is quoted here. But for the moment, think about those two words. Sincerity and in truth. And think about the two groups who worship in the two separate places and who hated each other's shadow. And if you were to look at the Samaritans and say, what would they need most? You'd say, truth. And if you turn towards Judea and say, what do they need most? You'd say, spirit. There was the truth, all right, down there. What advantage has the Jew? Much. Chiefly because under them were committed the oracles of God. But they worship God every Sabbath day, brethren and sisters, with not an atom of spirit. And there was no truth at all up here. And when true worshippers came together in spirit and in truth and saw one father, that would be the end of the controversy. Jesus didn't enter into the politics of that. He entered into the means of solving it. And he gave that woman, brothers and sisters, a wonderful invitation. For he says in verse 24, or end of verse 23, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. And you can imagine the Lord saying that. Look, woman, you need truth. You've got to get matters right. You're all mixed up. You're apostasy. Uh, you, 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 you're apostatizing from the truth of God. You've altered God's word. You've got to get that straight. And as far as the Jews are concerned, they've got to get a bit of spirit in their worship. But woman, woman, God is seeking you. And he hands her an invitation. There's the living water. There's the water. It's almost like holding a golden bowl. He says, the father, your father is seeking such to worship him. And he draw that woman in with that. But how is she going to be a child of God? Well, he said, God is spirit. Verse 24. Not as the authorised has it, God is a spirit, which is a very, very poor rendition, brethren and sisters. Very misleading. As if God is some vapour. He's not saying that. He said, God is spirit. Can't you see the point? If people are going to worship God with truth, and in spirit, well, they're going to learn, brethren and sisters, if I go to the Jewish oracles and I pick up the Jewish oracles and I go, salvation is from Israel, the first thing I learn is this, hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim is one Yahweh. 
That's the first commandment. That's the first thing I'm going to learn. And I'm going to learn, therefore, that when I come face to face with Israel's God, instead of burning my children to him like they did to the abominations of the heathen, I've got to develop myself and my children to be like him. And if he's spirit, I've got to worship him in spirit. Otherwise, he's not my father. You know what Paul says in the 12th chapter of Hebrews? He says, brethren, we have the fathers of our flesh, he said. We were in subjection to them. Shall we not rather be in subjection to the father of spirits? Moses called him in the 16th chapter of Numbers, the God of the spirits of all flesh. And spirit, brethren and sisters, is something that does duty for many things. The word does duty for many things. Not only power, but disposition, attitude, character, whatever. And therefore, if this father is going to be the father of them all, and if he's spirit, we've got to worship him in spirit. No other way. And that's why it is the father that's seeking people to worship him like that. He's trying to make children. Oh, it's a marvellous conversation. The woman said unto him, I know, she said, that Messiah cometh who is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. You know, brethren and sisters, she's well on the way to conversion. Well on the way to conversion. You know why? The Samaritans never, ever called the coming one Messiah. They believed that Moses would reappear and would accredit their worship as being the true worship according to the Pentateuch which they had altered. That's what they believed. And when they, he was to reappear, they had a couple of titles for him. They called him either the converter or the returning one. Never Messiah. That's a Jewish term. Well, she's been directed down there, hasn't she? And she's now convicted of that. I know that Messiah comes. She's already long down the road to conversion. No doubt about that. When he comes, she said, he'll tell us everything. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Upon this came his disciples. Look at that. You know, brethren and sisters, it's almost as if God, and we know he was, standing over that spot through his angels, watching that conversation, guiding all the events. The disciples have gone away to buy meat. They'd have gone everywhere to get the right thing so that nothing was polluted. Make sure they had everything that could be covered that it wasn't polluted by the touch of the Samaritan hand. And when they'd exhausted all their search and came back, they come running back to our Lord because he was hungry. And just as they got there, they got to the climatic point. The woman said, I know when Messiah comes. And the Lord sees them come and said, look, I'm he. And they came and she went. She walked straight away because she would have been embarrassed by those group of men. Because you see, as we've pointed out before, it was a disgrace for a Jew to talk even to his wife in public. Better to burn the law, said the rabbis, than to talk to a woman in public. And with the arrival of the disciples, she went. But not before that one great climatic point had been reached. She got to that point, and just in time, and then they came. How wonderful is that? Providence guided that situation without a shadow of doubt. I'm he, he said. And away she went. And as the disciples come hurrying up, they marveled that he talked to the woman. They marveled. Yet they didn't ask the two questions they wanted to ask. There were two questions, brethren and sisters, they wanted to ask him. The end of verse 7. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or, Why talkest thou with her? You see, the two things they would wonder was, Well, she couldn't help him. And surely, he didn't teach her anything. And that was the two things in their mind. They knew he needed food. They knew he was weary with his journey. He needed some help. But surely she couldn't do that. And it was even unthinkable to believe that he would talk to her. Whatever the case, brothers and sisters, John makes sure we know this, that in verse 28, she left her water pot. That woman is excited. It was a long way to that well. It wasn't really, as we understand from the record, in her vicinity because she didn't want to come there too often. It was a wearying journey. Carrying a heavy water pot, even without water, brethren and sisters, would be bad enough. But surely she wouldn't go and forget it. She left her water pot. 
In other words, her mind is so dominated by what she's just heard that the original intention for coming to that world is completely put out of mind. There's nothing material in that woman's mind. She's gone off without her water bottle. John makes that point. We might all understand, brethren and sisters, that that's exactly what we've got to do. We've got to get to a point in our life so highly excited about the power of this book that we leave things behind that have to do with our material comforts. Leave them behind. Let this dominate our thoughts. And she rushes back to her countrymen. And she comes, she tells them in verse 29, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? The Greek literally says this, can this be the Christ? It puts a different inflection upon our brothers and sisters. It's like she hurries back, forgetting all about a water pot, water pot, runs back to the men, she says, can this really be him? It's too good to be true. And she starts preaching the word, brothers and sisters. Preaching the word she does. Come and see. She wants them to be convinced for themselves. Now the marvellous thing about the Samaritans is that they spontaneously believed her word. Verse 39, And many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified. It wasn't as if she told them one thing, she testified. Come see a man that told me all I ever did. And we made the point last time, brethren and sisters, that Jews wanted signs, they wanted miracles, Wonders. They wanted all those things. The Samaritans believed indirectly through a woman. And even when the Lord left them after his two days stay with them, he still didn't perform any miracle except to read her mind. But he left behind him a harvest ready for the reaping. Didn't get that in jury. No way did he. In the meantime, back to 31, verse 31, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. And you can see what's happening. The woman's gone off. The unanswered, the, 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 the unanswered and unexpressed questions are in their mind. But for the moment, they look back at their master. They remember, brethren and sisters, that when they left him, he was weary with his journey. He would need a bit of sustenance. But they don't find a man tired and hungry anymore. He's revitalized. Master, eat. But he says, look, I've got meat to eat that ye know not of. And he said this, my meat, in verse 34, is to do the will of him that sent me. Now, brethren and sisters, why would he say that? Why would he direct the disciples' attention to a special kind of meat in this context? What's that got to do with a Samaritan woman? I'll tell you what it's got to do with a Samaritan woman. Everything! Because John tells us expressly what the will of God is. Jesus said, it is my will, me, is to do the will of him that sent me. Now you turn over to John chapter 6. John expressly tells us what that will is. Not in one place only, but in many places. But here he says this. In John chapter 6 and at verse 40. Or verse 39, And this is the Father's will that has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. That's the will of the Father, brethren and sisters. Or to put it in another way, as Peter does, God is not willing that any should perish. It is God's will that people should be saved. And when God singles out people to be called to his truth, it is his will that he lose nothing. Well, he's just had a meal. Because he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. That's what God's will is. You know what they're telling us, brothers and sisters? Every convert the Lord made was a stimulus to him. That's true, isn't it, individually? And it's certainly true of the ecclesia. We have witnessed in recent weeks two or three baptisms. Every time a person is baptised in this bath upon which I'm standing here, it is a stimulus to this ecclesia. That's the will of God. That's our meat and drink. And that was exactly right in that context. He's just had a meal. There she goes. He's been stimulated by her her, uh, enthusiasm for the truth. 
And so the Lord said to his disciples, this is the, he said, my meat in verse 34 is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Finish it. It doesn't finish with you Jews. The word finish there, brethren and sisters, doesn't quite mean that. The word is from the word teleos, which means to accomplish, to complete, to bring to a finale. In other words, this is the finale. What's the finale? People like that woman of Samaria. The Jews are not the finale. They just happen to be from the, those from whom salvation comes. It's a question of continuance through them. It's coming from and through them. But the finale is woman like that, that woman of Samaria. That's the finale of God's work. That he should draw together in one, says John, the children of God which are scattered abroad, which he says in chapter 12. He should draw in one all the children of God which are scattered abroad. Now while all this is going on, of course, the men of Samaria are racing out of the cities and coming across the fields towards our Lord. Now I believe that you've got to create a mental picture here to get the point of the next words of our Lord. You see, here are the disciples, and they're obviously concentrating upon our Lord, and he's looking over their shoulder, and he's seeing this crowd of people come racing across towards him. And so having spoken about meat, he says in verse 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. That doesn't happen, brethren and sisters, in the natural course of events. Sower and reaper do not rejoice together. If we were to go out sowing and finish our work, we're going to rejoice in the completion of that work. But we will not have the reaper there. It will be several months hence before the reaper is able to finish his work and rejoice. They will not rejoice together. But they're about to rejoice together here. That's why he said to his disciples, looking over their shoulder, he said, now don't say to me that there's a period of time between sowing and, 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 and reaping so that there will be separate rejoicings. I'm telling you, he said, when we talk about a spiritual harvest, reaping everlasting life, we're going to do it, do it together. Now he's just sowed the word in that woman's heart. The sower went out to sow. That's the son of man. And he sowed that seed in the woman's heart. She's raced off to the Samaritans. And in those cities, like water from the well being poured on dry water, springing up like the willows of the water course, here they come racing across the field. Here comes the harvest. And Jesus said to his disciples, you're about to go reaping. And I've just done some sowing. We're going to rejoice together. Verse 37, he says, And herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. You know, Rotherham renders that, along with other translations, herein that saying holds good. There was a saying around, brethren and sisters, a little proverb, went like this. And I'll, I believe it went something like this. Huh, one sows, huh, another reaps. It was a saying, obviously, put in the negative, about economic injustices. Somebody did all the work. The other fellow got the benefits. But this time Jesus said, herein is that saying holds good. It's good this time because we'll rejoice together so that both he that soweth and he that reapeth gathereth wages unto life eternal. We're going to do that together. What a marvellous thing that is, brethren and sisters. Just before we move on, I want to draw your attention to a little expression in verse 35. But when he directed his disciples to look behind them at the Samaritans racing across the fields, he said, lift up your eyes. Now we'll go back to Isaiah 49. Lift up your eyes. This is why we reserve this passage, because I wanted to save it for here. Verse 10 is the one that he, he alluded to before. They shall not hunger nor thirst. And the chapter, of course, opens up, listen, O Gentiles. It's a message to the nations. Just for the record, you'll notice in the margin of verse 10, there's a, it's a quotation in Revelation 7 and verse 17, where it says, Neither shall the sun smite them, nor any heat. That's quoted in Revelation 7 and verse 17, where the 144,000 are gathered out of all nations. Now then, this chapter is about a woman who had a family, a large family, and she lost them all. They went off. 
lost them all. When all they all left home and she's left on her own and she comes crying on God's shoulder. Verse 14 says that. And God directs her attention to the fact that he's going to give her another family. They're going to be a very large family. So large, he says in verse 20, the children which thou shalt have after thou hast lost the other shall say again in thine ears, the place is too small for me. Give place to me that I may dwell. So God's answer to this distressed woman is, look, don't worry about the family you've lost. You're going to have another family so much bigger that the children are going to say to you, Mum, the house is not big enough. You're going to have to build a bigger house. Where are they going to come from? Well, she's told in verse 18 to lift up her eyes. And she says, and in verse 22, they're going to come from here. Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will lift up my hand of the Gentiles. That's where they're going to come from. That's why in verse 21, she doesn't know who their father is. Because she doesn't recognize them as her relations. But they will be. And so when the Lord said to his disciples, Lift up your eyes. He was alluding to that chapter. He says to that woman, lift up your eyes. And she looked, you see this crowd of people coming, all Gentiles. She says, who's their father? Who hath begotten me these? Well, they're all the children of God by faith, not by law. They're all the children of God by faith. And lo, from the Gentiles, all these children are coming. You know, brethren and sisters, that's a marvellous verse of scripture. That whole section is marvellous. As it moves through Isaiah's prophecy, it depicts this family all coming around the woman's skirts, this mother that has been desolate, and all the children are filling up the tent. And Isaiah the prophet goes on and tells her that she'd better get out some more tent pegs. She'd better make differences to that tent. She'd better stretch it this way and stretch it that way because more and more people are coming and she needs more and more accommodation in that tent. And the man chosen, brethren and sisters, to fulfill that that, that passage of scripture was himself a tent maker who went around the world stretching out God's tent for children who were coming from everywhere that they might be incorporated in that family. The former tent wasn't big enough. Wonderful, absolutely marvellous. Lift up your eyes, is all our Lord said. What a marvellous expression when you take it back to that chapter of Scripture. Now when we come back to the fourth chapter of John, and we see the result, brothers and sisters, of the woman's preaching as she came to those men and told them about a man who told her all that she ever did. And so we take up again at verse 37. Herein is that saying holds good. One soweth and another reapeth. Now listen to this. He said to his apostles, his disciples, I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labour. Other men laboured, and ye are entered into their labours. That, brethren and sisters, is from Joshua 24. You have a look with me. And that's why we reserve this one too, because we were able to gather them up together. And in the 24th chapter of Joshua, that allusion is back here. Verse 12 of Joshua 24 says, I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. I have given you a land for which ye did not labour. I sent you to reap whereupon ye bestowed no labour. Israel walked into a land, brethren and sisters, ready made. Why? How could they do that? Because Yahoshua conquered the Canaanites. And here is that same Yahoshua, now in, of course, not the same Yahoshua, but the real Yahoshua. Here is the antitype of that type. Here is the substance of that shadow in exactly the same place using exactly the same words, but he hasn't conquered them, brethren and sisters, with sword and bow, he's just conquered their hearts. And the disciples are going to be surrounded by brethren and sisters for which they haven't lifted a finger. The same as those Israelites walked in on top of the cities and all the fields of the Canaanites that had been built up over the centuries and got them for nothing. Because Yahoshua had conquered them, as Yahoshua had conquered these people. You know, brethren and sisters, we read, don't we, in the 8th chapter of Acts, that when Philip Upon the persecution of Saul, when he was thrust out of the city of Jerusalem, he went down among the Samaritans, and many of the Samaritans believed. And Philip went down there and found the harvest, white the harvest, didn't he? But Philip hadn't lifted a finger before he got down there. And he found them ready to believe him, because Yahashua had been there before him and conquered them, brethren and sisters. And this story, in the fourth chapter of John, that we are considering, 
finishes with a remarkable expression that the Samaritans, we read in verse 41, and many more believe because of his own word. And they said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy sake, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. The Saviour of the world. Look at the conviction, brethren and sisters. If they are now convinced by hearing the Lord, and by the way, they've been listening to him in verse 40 for two days. So after two days of instruction, they come to this conviction that he's the saviour of the world. Now he had told them, salvation is from the Jews. And in the chapter of Isaiah, where Isaiah points out that the world was made to be inhabited, he said that all those who worship the idols and the vanity of the nations, he said, will come to nothing. They'll all be confounded. But Israel would be saved, world without end. There'd be a world without end when Israel are saved, brethren and sisters. And here is the saviour of the world. They have now been convinced that salvation is from the Jews. It doesn't matter where you go. Isaiah 45 points out that they shall come from the ends of the earth and shall worship at the, at the footstool of the Lord Jesus Christ and acknowledge that the Jews, that the Jews are the channel of God's purpose. The ends of the earth will do that, says Isaiah. World without end. And these Samaritans have been convinced of that. They've accepted the truth of the matter. And you know, brethren and sisters, when you think about it, that wouldn't be easy, would it? I mean, that wouldn't have been easy. It's all right to lay emphasis on the fact, all right, Salvation is not unique to the Jews, but it's through them. It's all right to lay the emphasis on that, but you've still got to go to the Jew, don't you? That would not have been easy. You think about that. These are pretty great people when you work out. The Jews hated them, despised them, but they believed with precious little proof except the Lord's own words. They didn't want signs and wonders. You look at the 47th and 48th verses of that chapter and you will see that when Jesus went into Galilee into his own country, they immediately sought for signs. John tells us that immediately after that story. He'd no sooner left the cities of the Samaritans than the Jews immediately want signs. They didn't want signs. And what they had to believe, brethren and sisters, was not easy. You know, there are a lot of things like that in life. We build up prejudices against people, against things, whatever. And there are times in our life, brethren and sisters, when the word of God fronts us up. And we've got to see something in sincerity and in truth. And it's not always easy to believe it. And there's a lot of humble pie to be at. A lot of pride to be swallowed. And I can imagine that group around our Lord Jesus Christ. He's a Jew. They recognise him as such. The woman said that. How is it that thou being a Jew? They knew he was a Jew. But they had to come to that. And they did. And that title that he should be the saviour of the world, is first used in the New Testament by those Samaritans. Later on, it's written in one of, into John's epistle, the saviour of the world. They had to learn that wonderful lesson, as we've had to learn it, brethren and sisters, salvation is of the Jews. Oh yes, very wonderful, especially since they won the Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War, the 1956 War, wonderful. But I wonder, brethren and sisters, if we really knew Jews for what they really are, or whether we were ever subjected to their contempt and self-righteousness, whether it would have been as easy to have accepted the hope of Israel. I wonder if it would have been so easy. We say it so quickly and so glibly, but we don't live with them. We don't know them very much. We only know them by what's written. We don't know them as people. I wonder if we'd have been as ready to accept it as those people were, because they lived right alongside of it and had every good reason to hold them in supreme and utter contempt. But they believed it, and they believed that he was the saviour of the world. 